here. As introduce myself, I'm Vishnu, Vishnu PR. I am from Trivandrum, Kerala. I am uh, working as the regional coordinator for South Indian states and union territories uh, uh, here at, from reporting from headquarters of Padam India. So before uh, getting to the session, getting into the session, I just want to share a couple of things as a general disclaimer that today's whole session will be completely non-medical, uh, more into management, administration, and operation. So basically how to uh, start and, org uh, and organize and implement your parity care services in your regions across throughout the country. So that's, uh, that's more into, sometimes uh, it gets boring, but we'll try to make it more simple and uh, interactive. And we'll try to highlight what are the important things which you should keep in mind as a potential palliative care physician. And next thing, basically, the, today's session, uh, today's meeting is divided into two sections. First section, I'll be taking it. Uh, basically, I'll be uh, highlighting on the various uh, services which Palim India organize uh, and implement here in Trivandrum through our Palim India headquarters, our headquarters here at, uh, situated in Trivandrum. So how basically we organize for the last 18 years, how are we organizing and implementing palliative care services? Uh, second section, as uh, Sri Priya said, my colleague Sunanta Samal, she is the regional coordinator from Central India. She'll be taking the sec uh, second section. Uh, basically, how we are facilitating these services which we are doing here in uh, this part of the country to other states uh, throughout the country, how we are facilitating it, what are our challenges, what where our experiences working with state governments, NHMs, other private stakeholders. Basically, uh, we'll get into minute details of how, what are the ground realities as a, again, as a potential palliative care physician, if, either if you are associated with an existing palliative care facility or uh, if you are uh, planning to start one on your own, that uh, section will be more useful. So let me try to share my screen. Hope my screen is visible and I'm audible. Yeah, sure. yeah thank you. So. Today's uh, session is presented to you uh, by the State Facilitation Division of Palium India. Uh, in detail about State Facilitation Division, Sunanda will be explaining further uh, in this session. But just to give an intro, State Facilitation Division is the one division which is responsible for facilitating every single activities what we are demonstrating here in Trivandrum. This division, especially uh, regional coordinators, will be responsible for getting in touch with you uh, once your training is completed, we'll get in touch with you. Each one of you, uh, according to your regions, corresponding regional coordinators will get in touch with you and we'll support you how to start your own services, how to handle uh, private stakeholders for funding, how to procure opioids. All those nitty gritties will be helping with you. We'll be uh, with you throughout your palliative care career and palliative care journey. So state facilitation division is a very uh, small division. Uh, five team members are there and leading by uh, Shalini Arora Joseph. She is the head of state facilitation division. And we four, there are four regional coordinators reporting to Shalini. Uh, as I said here, I am the regional coordinator for South India. Sunanda here is the regional coordinator for Central India. Uh, Mr. Rajinder Dutt Bajelwan, he is from, uh, he is handling the Northern region. And Mr. Ronsu Sangma, he is handling the Northeast region. So basically these, we are uh, categorized into four regions. Uh, north, northeast, central, and southern part of India for our operational efficiency and uh, other engagements. So, if you are, uh, if wherever you are from these regions, corresponding region coordinators will, will be your first point of contact once your training gets completed. So, I'll get into the session. So, all our sessions we start with this magic triangle defined that defined by WHO, the World Health Organization. So, according to World Health Organization. If a palliative care service should be successful, all these three services should be delivered, should be balanced in right way. Uh, if you can see, all these components are interconnected to each other. Uh, without one uh, parameter, other two cannot stand alone. So if you are saying about education parameter, the one side of uh, uh, the trying education. So basically, there is a huge lack of awareness, education. Basically, we, there is lack of consciousness among the public uh, administrators and medical professionals. You know, uh, most of uh, the participants here are doctors, I believe. So uh, even uh, during the community, Okay, so even uh, during the com uh, for among community among the doctors, nurses, and allied health workers, there is various uh, myths around palliative care. What is palliative care? When, when should we start the palliative care? Uh, how are we going to do it? 
So basically, education is needed on that end with among the medical professionals. And the next category is, of course, the administrator, the government guys, policy makers. Uh, most of the time, we used to uh, educate them or uh, in our meetings, we need to literally make them aware about the laws which they have created for us. So uh, there is a huge lack of awareness among the uh, policy makers. And third, and the most important, uh, we, need, we should educate the public, the layman. They are the uh, backbone uh, of Palam India. They are the community volunteers. We need to educate them uh, regarding the nitty gritties of palliative care. Uh, moving on to the next side of the uh, triangle is drug availability. As you all might know, uh, pain relief is one of the core uh, uh, component of palliative care. Uh, opioid accessibility, safe opioid accessibility is still a major issue, in, uh, especially saying in the Indian context, it is still an issue. Uh, even though we have a couple of laws uh, for uh, smooth procuring and dispensing of opioids, but still, uh, if you ask, if you are associated with the palliative care facility, you must be already aware about how hard it is to procure all the documentation to uh, uh, procure opioids and dispense opioids, basically morphine, methadone, uh, those things. So uh, drug availability, basic uh, opioid and accessibility is a major component of one side. And both these components are directly connected to the third side of the one, policy and its implementation. So basically, in Indian context, uh, we have a couple of uh, policies already created. For example, National Palliative Care uh, uh, Program. We have an NPPC program. Then we have a national health policy uh, that came in 2017, uh, which included palliative care in primary care institutions, ONMS, uh, ASHA workers, in including doctors also. We have that policy. We have an NDPS Amendment Act for uh, procuring opioids, uh, smooth procurement of opioids. We have uh, we have included uh, education curriculum in undergraduate uh, curriculum for I think it's for NDPS students till it's in the infant stage. But still, creating policies uh, for uh, uh, safe quality and uh, easy access to palliative care is one of the major uh, part. If you are trying to create a palliative care service on on your own. So uh, these are the three major uh, components as per WHO. Uh, without these three uh, components, a palliative care program cannot be successful. So yeah, uh, the million dollar question, what exactly is palliative care? So I'm not here to debate uh, about uh, your understanding about palliative care, but I'll try to share some insights of palliative care, which we believe uh, at Palliative India. This will be very helpful for you to, when you try to consolidate, when you try to create strategies for how uh, a palliative care should be created on your region. So as a definition, uh, yeah, here is it listed correctly. Palliative care is an active holistic area for all individuals in all age groups uh, trying to alleviate serious health-related suffering. So serious health-related suffering, this is the new definition. Over the years, many definitions have come for palli palliative care, and I'm sure after 10 years from now, there will be new definition for palliative care. So this is this definition, the uh, documentation, the terminology is uh, evolving over the years. So as of now, we are trying to alleviate the prevention and treatment of serious health-related suffering is a, a kind of a definition for palliative care. And uh, sharing some of the uh, myths associated with palliative care, so we believe that palliative care should start at the time of diagnosis itself. Most of the time we get these questions from common man, even from doctors, when should we refer the patient for a palliative care service? Uh, we always, always we say it should be at the time of diagnosis so that we could reduce the illness related suffering for that patient then and there. Palliative care is not limited to cancer patient or terminal patient. You know, uh, you have already learned that from the training department that palliative care is not only limited to terminal ill patients, uh, we have other uh, serious health related sufferings comes under that uh, category. Palliative care covers bereavement support to the family. So this is one of the major components of palliative media. Our social workers, our social officers provide bereavement support. Even after the patient is spared, they provide the bereavement support, the emotional support to the family, if any uh, other support uh, the family or the caregivers require. Next one is the palliative care aims to improve the quality of life of the patients, family, and caregivers. So this is another myth uh, associated with palliative care. Most of the people say patient is the uh, main central point of palliative care, yes. But we, along, we at Palim India, we believe that along with patients, we should focus for the family and caregivers. Most of the time, immediate dependence of family members will be the caregivers, but 
along with wherever we focus uh, to uh, detail about patients, we always focus more on caregivers. These are the care, care, most of the time caregivers are neglected from the mainstream discussions. So another major important uh, aspect of pallium in India or uh, the advanced palliative care terminology is the total care concept. We not only uh, take into consideration of the physical aspect of that patient and family, we also take into consideration of the psychological, socioeconomic, and spiritual aspect of that particular family. Because uh, these are the four, again, these are the four main components of the total care concept. If a patient uh, is, uh, if we are trying to address the patient's physical uh, aspects only, then there, there, there have many issues uh, uh, previously in our experiences. Because if you say, and I say, uh, take it as an example, uh, many times, on, uh, recently, last week, I, when I talked to a social officer at Pallium India, they, was, they were visiting, uh, having a home visit at a patient here in Trivandrum. He, uh, he was uh, diagnosed with an advanced uh, stage of cancer. So he was saying that one only concern for me, uh, what makes me worrying is about the education of my child. He, they are really worse, uh, have worse of financial crisis. So uh, that's the major concern uh, of that particular patient. So our social workers connected with our funding funders and uh, that with the local school, they have ensured that that child uh, gets free education till uh, the total standard. So this, uh, when they inform this to that patient, the amount of uh, mental uh, uh, well-being he got, that's the uh, that's the major component which we uh, uh, provide through psychological approach. Uh, you know, uh, many of the patients, especially the palliative care patients, are struggling with their financial crisis. That's one of the parameters which we address there. Coming to the spiritual thing, most of the time, spiritual, uh, when we hear about the spiritual aspect of palliative care, most of them believe it's faith-based or religion-based. No, it's not. Really, of course, it is religion and faith component is there. But by spiritual uh, thing, we are uh, trying to address the thought process of spiritual thought process and perspective of that particular patient. Why has God uh, given me this uh, particular disease? Why, are, why is God punishing me? How uh, my surroundings, how my society, how my relatives, how my family members will get affected due to my disease condition? Basically, the spiritual consciousness of that particular patient, that's what we are addressing. Any intervention, any engagement, any action to a particular beneficiary provided uh, by Palim India as an organization, will be taken on the basis of these four components. The, uh, every, every time, whether it's pain assessing, whether it's uh, addressing a particular financial assistance, anything, these are the four parameters which we take into consideration. So yeah, uh, you can see the uh, historical gap between the micro and macro component of this uh, paradigm. Uh, at micro level, we have this lonely families uh, affected by the uh, both financially and other socio-cultural uh, affect, affected by that, those factors. They are isolated, they are stranded, they have nowhere they can access to this macro level institution, which is the government, medical colleges, or any other institution. These institutions are getting bigger and bigger every day. They are getting sophisticated and most advanced healthcare treatments, are. they are getting uh, updated every single day. But uh, the gap between the beneficiary and these institutions are getting huge. They, are, they have a huge disconnect between these institutions. And that's where uh, the MISO component of that particular, uh, we, where we bring the community for linking this family, this patient to these macro institutions. So community-based uh, service. If you ask me why Pallium India has become a flag bearer or a, a pioneer in palliative care in India over the last 18 years, this is due to this uh, component. Palim India has utilized the community-based uh, palliative care services even from its beginning. Community-based uh, home care services, community-based palliative care services is the best model by far we have seen it. Where if you are planning to start a, a palliative care service in your region, it's always better to orient and create awareness among the neighborhood or the community. Uh, just to give a basic orientation, definitely if you are orienting around 50 people, you might only get a five active volunteers, but that five active volunteers will stay with you forever. So uh, with them, you can easily link. Uh, they'll create a good setting for you as a palliative care physician or a palliative care team. You could just go there. You can treat it, treat the patients. And without this gap, 
you can easily bridge the gap uh, with the support of the community. And as a state, Kerala uh, has always, always uh, been in forefront with the palliative care model. Uh, at times, uh, people are saying that, uh, Kerala palliative care model is the best. But uh, having said all these things, uh, as a care light, I personally believe uh, community-based palliative care model is the best model by far, especially in the Indian context. And yes, true to the fact that Kerala as a state has uh, not only utilized, they have exploited the uh, community strength for providing palliative care services in the country. So coming to the core uh, component of our session, how to organize a palliative care service, especially in the Indian context. So these are the basic building blocks which uh, uh, you could take into consideration. Uh, before uh, starting uh, to express this, uh, to mention this, you should first, uh, if you are associated with an existing hospital or a facility, or if you are, I understand that there are management professionals also there and, and this attending in this meeting. So if you start planning to start your own palliative care service, the first thing you should uh, have in your mind or should decide is about what kind of service you are providing. Basically, there are we have three types of services, outpatient uh, service, inpatient service, and a home-based home care palliative care service, which is the most suitable thing. There is not a universal uh, formula or a magic solution for that, but you should decide for yourself which is the most suitable uh, suited for you. Once you have decided that, the next thing is to recruit a team a dedicated palliative care team for you. So you can see in the first slide, uh, first uh, block, recruit and train a palliative care team. Basic requirement of a palliative care service, whether it's outpatient or inpatient uh, or home care service, basic requirement, basic human resource requirement is the three people, doctor, nurse, and a social worker. For us, social worker is one of the key components for us as a paliative care as an organization, social work, professional social workers right from uh, the beginning while registering the patient to uh, our inpatient or outpatient facility, uh, then uh, having counseling uh, sessions with the patient and the family members, even as I said earlier, with the bereavement support. Once the patient is expired, these social workers are will be there with the family members for quite a period of time uh, for helping them emotionally and uh, trying to uh, trying to give a good meaning to their life after uh, their loved one get expired. So uh, you can go further in advanced stages uh, by having physiotherapists and pharmacists while establishing as an institution or a structural change, you can uh, uh, move on to new. Once you have recruited these uh, human resources, the next thing is to give adequate training and education for your people. Most of the time, I, I said earlier, uh, training is a key component for all these people. And we, uh, like Palim India, uh, we have various uh, institutions delivering training courses, advanced training courses for palliative care. Uh, so individually for doctors, nurses, social workers, even for palliative care assistants like drivers, allied health workers, we have exclusive training programs for that. Once, so once the recruitment and training of uh, your team is ready and you are ready to provide the services, next uh, is about the infrastructure. So if it is an OP, you should have a basic, I'm, see, I am saying in a layman terms to understand for uh, both management professionals and uh, medical professionals, so this is a basic thing. Once these sessions are over, once you get trained as a, from the FCPM batch, we'll get in touch with you, we'll uh, connect with you, we'll discuss with each one of these points in detail, but this is for just for your learning and just for your reference to get an idea, to decide for yours throughout your training period, you can decide for yourself which is the best one and how we can go about it. So uh, outpatient service, you, yeah, either it's a, uh, if there's a basic room for you, the basic spacing and furniture, uh, you can have that. For home care, vehicles are the main major component for home care. Without uh, vehicles, uh, home care cannot be uh, that. There are uh, stakeholders, partners with us in some of the states. Uh, the doctor take us two-wheeler and uh, uh, with him, another nurse will be traveling with the medical box in their carrying food. So uh, each one of you has a different agenda. Each one of you have a different strategy. Each one of you have a different meaning for providing therapy. So you can say that according to us. The third point here, I'll uh, halt and I'll uh, mention the involvement of community volunteers. I have already uh, shared with you about the importance of uh, community volunteers. Once you have decided, you have created or recruited a team, uh, they got the adequate training, you have decided which service you have to start. Whether it's OP, IP, or home care, you should definitely go for community. It's a, basically it's a suggestion. It's not mandatory, but community volunteers will be key to the success of your. It, it, they will ensure the sustainability of your palliative care services. 
uh, once you if you give an orientation session, as I said, there will be a limited number of active volunteers, but those active volunteers will be uh, your, your flag bearers or faculty service so throughout the neighborhood. They will act as the bridge between the patients and the PC, palliative care service. Uh, if they'll uh, correctly identify where are your beneficiaries uh, there, how we could uh, help them. All these, uh, actually they have the answers. That's what our social engagement team says. Next thing is, of course, arranging funds. Uh, as a management uh, professional, I'll also uh, suggest, apart from the compassion and empathy, which we uh, have uh, while starting these services or while delivering these services, uh, financial sustainability is a major key point for uh, 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 palliative care service. Uh, so we have various uh, funding uh, options from government. Yes, there are limited uh, grants available to uh, palliative care services, palliative care centers, and individuals who are willing to start a palliative care services. There are individual donations available. CS, the corporate social responsibility, is a uh, upcoming uh, uh, component, an integral part of Palamindia's. Uh, financial uh, network, charitable organizations are also an option for that. Again, another important thing which you should uh, highly focus on is the procuring of opioids at your facility, which of these either in home care or uh, uh, outpatient or inpatient facility. RMI, uh, the procuring of opioids, having opioid accessibility is a major key uh, component of the your palliative care service. Procuring opioids, most of the time, it's a difficult task, especially in the Indian context. You, have, you will have a different uh, and completely different session uh, for opioid accessibility in coming days. But I'll just a brief, give a brief so that you, you have a good idea on that. So uh, in 1985, we had this uh, narcotic uh, drug psycho and psychotropic substance act. That act made us available of the uh, opioid under the regulation of the law. But uh, that old uh, process was a bit tedious. You have to roam around multiple departments to get the licenses of uh, RMI uh, or procuring opioids. But now in 2014, 2014, we had an amendment uh, to the uh, NDPS Act, which made the State Drug Control Office is the nodal authority for issuing the uh, RMI certificate. RMI is an abbreviation for Registered Medical Institution. So if you are having a, a, a palliative care institution, you should apply. There are a couple of forms available. You should fill out that forms and send to the state drug controller's office in your state. Mostly, uh, drug controller's office is located at the capital city of the state. You can uh, send these uh, documents to them. They'll cross-check it and they'll issue an RMI certificate. So this RMI certificate makes you eligible for procuring and uh, stocking and dispensing morphine or methadone. There are, I think uh, there are around six drugs issued by the government of India. Uh, you can procure from the local vendor and uh, use accordingly. So documentation, simple but effective documentation is one of the major components uh, while using opioids. So all those details, there are, uh, I, I, as I said, it's a complete individual session for opioid accessibility. So uh, in coming days, you will be having that. Creating awareness, uh, as I have already mentioned that, uh, creating awareness. Basically, awareness is not the actual word. I'll use the consciousness. Basically, it's, uh, it, we need to create a public consciousness uh, with all these stakeholders so that uh, we, could, uh, we could connect the dots between these uh, stakeholders. So uh, developing OP, uh, as I said, it's an uh, infrastructure base. If you have a one room or a one big hall, that's definitely good. If it is a disabled friendly hall uh, with toilet washroom facilities, that's great and we, you should need essential medical equipments there. And while procuring, while handling, this opioid, uh, we'll uh, repeatedly say this opioid is a very sensitive thing, uh, especially if there is a chance of uh, opioid abuse and uh, misuse. So government is pretty sensitive and strict in that sense. So uh, if you are starting minimally, very small office service, you should have a definitely have a opioid lockbox so that you can uh, uh, keep it safe. Then documentation, I said, I have already said, simple and effective documentation should be there, even for an outpatient service. The basically the info and outflow of patients, the patient assessments, phone, the wound chart, all these documents we'll be sharing with you. Uh, just how to have one. Developing home service, PC assistant, palliative care assistant is one of the core uh, human resource uh, needed for home based service. PC assistant is basically the driver only uh, driving the vehicle, but he'll be acting as a health allied health worker. Uh, having a basic knowledge of how to uh, handle the documentation while uh, the home visit, the home care team visits a particular beneficiary. 
IP, you all know, uh, it's kind of an hospital infrastructure where pay patients need to be uh, admitted with uh, an X number of beds. The establishing connects is the final point. So uh, while we, uh, actually after the training, while we are getting in touch with you people, this is the major component where we will be supporting you, especially how to uh, have a good rapport with your local government agencies, starting from the panchayats and municipalities to the state drug control office, to the health department, just being uh, after having all the documentation after even the smallest mistake which we uh, done on this documentation can interrupt the relationship between these administrators or the government officials which in turn will affect the delivery of our palliative care service to our patients so that uh, there is an accountability there so we should be more responsible for that one so uh, yeah uh, as i said earlier all these points will be uh, again, we'll be uh, saying, uh, telling you repeatedly. From here in this slide, the community volunteers and procuring opioids, you should highly focus on this part. These are the two major components of that. Coming to Palam India model, uh, we are acclaimed uh, for this model. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the demonstrate, educate, and facilitate model. So, as I said at the beginning, whatever we are demonstrating here at the Trivandrum is more kind of a proof of uh, concept or a prototype or a model of palliative care, which we believe is the, by, far, by far the best one, which we can uh, educate other stakeholders like medical professionals, like you people or other stakeholders. We can make them aware, uh, make, uh, educate them, or train them on whatever we are demonstrating here. And the final phase is the facilitation. That's what where we comes as a division. State facilitation is responsible for facilitating all these services, what we are doing here in Toronto. So uh, the demonstration, we'll get into details on uh, next slides. We have a flagship facility here at Trivandrum Institute of Palliative Sciences called TIPS. So through TIPS, we are delivering all these services. We have link centers. We have outpatient services in government hospitals. We are providing outpatient services through government hospitals. And we have the home care, which is one of the backbone of Palliative India services. Yeah, getting into the uh, details of demonstration, uh, this is this picture is the uh, Trivandrum Institute of Palliative Science. It is a WHO collaborating center for training and policy for access to pain relief. Uh, it, we have an inpatient uh, care here. We have we provide outpatient care with the government hospitals. Uh, basically, home care services provided. Rehabilitation is one of the uh, major area which we focus on. Uh, community participation with link centers. Link centers, uh, as I uh, said earlier, the community volunteers will be linking our medical team and the beneficiaries directly in their uh, area. Uh, halfway home is a new concept uh, uh, created by Palin India, where we support spinal cord uh, uh, insured uh, patients. We'll have a, a separate room, a home kind of setting. They are halfway through their homes. Before getting into the, their, their home, they are given a situation, they are given a condition where they can leave, they, they can adjust to the daily routine without uh, uh, getting help from others. We train them uh, accordingly. So far, uh, 21,291 patients and their families have been seen in Trivandrum. It's changing across uh, community engagement through 87 volunteers. These 87 volunteers are very, very active volunteers like employees, but without being paid. And we have around 14 link centers in Trivandrum. This is the basic picture of a link center. Uh, this is a makeshift link center. Uh, the community volunteers here have requested the uh, school authorities. It's a public school. Uh, hall. They have uh, uh, requested, with their permission of school authorities, they are running, operating this link center. I think it's on a uh, weekend basis. So uh, you can see our medical team there, doctors and nurses, our team will visit there. Volunteers will in, uh, bring on uh, the uh, patients and other beneficiaries. Uh, here we will provide the treatment care. So those patients, those beneficiaries who can't visit with such link centers, we will go to their homes for the home visit. So this is a basic, uh, basically a picture, an ideal picture for home visit. This is, you can see this is a really hilly area. It's not motorable road. Uh, our medical team's here. You can see in the middle, that's the uh, uh, honorable Dr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Rajagopal sir. We have the medical team there. We have the community volunteers also visiting the home care. So basically our focus is to reach the patient where they are located. That's the uh, basic motto behind the home care visit. Uh, most of the time, I have heard from the social workers that patients are repeatedly commenting that they feel a qualified life, they feel more dignity, more pride 
when they are getting treated in their home instead of uh, at their uh, hospitals. That's uh, uh, one of the insights which we have learned from our social workers. So using making uh, use of existing resources is one of the key uh, element of Salem India. You can see here, I think uh, this is a young patient who have met with an accident. They are doing a physiotherapy session. This patient can't get outside his uh, home and uh, go to a hospital. So we are, our uh, social engagement team has created this ramp kind of structure, uh, making uh, use of available low cost, cost effective mechanism for that young guy to uh, do the sessions. Rehabilitation, as I said, uh, on right hand side, that's the patient himself. He, he has been trained into the umbrella making uh, so that most of the time, you know, the breadwinners are uh, affected with the disease and uh, the whole family get affected with that. And when, whenever possible, we try to give them the soft skills and other hard skills to these patients so that they can earn uh, the basic income themselves. On the left-hand side, side, the sewing machine is given to the caregiver who are having a, 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 a so uh, yes, uh, this is a, a, a separate initiative of Pallium India. Uh, as you all know, uh, on this, most of the palliative care patients are, uh, affected with serious health uh, conditions are affected, uh, very uh, seriously affected financially. So uh, if I, most of the time, we also ask our team members internally, uh, what is the point of providing just medicines if the whole family is starving? So you can see here, our nurse is carrying the medical box and other, these are the community volunteers uh, providing food rations. We provide monthly, weekly food rations to some of those families which, uh, they, when they can afford it. These food rations are uh, delivered uh, to multiple homes in Toronto. These are the basic services which Palim India as an organization provides. We feel like these, these services are also included in palliative care. Palliative care means uh, not only, as I said earlier, this is a total care uh, concept. Not only the physical attributes, we are also focusing on spiritual, uh, psychosocial, and the socioeconomic attributes. These are the children of the uh, either uh, children of the uh, very, uh, who are grieving uh, with their family members. We support them uh, with their educational needs, with their financial needs. It's in Malayalam, it's called Kutikutam. Uh, basically, it's a kids collective. We are uh, uh, supporting them with various community engagement initiatives. Most of the time, children are children are the one who get affected uh, or pulled out of their schools uh, due to the financial constraints or any other condition with any their family members. We, they, we have uh, we have a couple of helplines uh, uh, operated by Palim India. It's a national palliative care telehealth uh, helpline. Patients and families can uh, take uh, use of the service. Even medical professionals can have both audio and video telemedicine consultation are there. Uh, you can see the timings. Uh, four languages is available, English, Hindi, Malayalam, and Tamil. Another helpline which we have started during the COVID uh, period is uh, the Sukduk helpline. Uh, we are providing emotional support uh, to uh, patients or to other caregivers or volunteers. These are uh, these services are available in eight languages. You can see the languages. These are the timings. So uh, I'm coming to the end of the demonstration phase. This is a document. This documents we will be sharing with you. This is a basic audit tool standards for Indian palliative care programs. Uh, this is uh, really suited to the Indian uh, context. Uh, these documents are for your self uh, evaluation or self auditing. Uh, I'm not getting into those details. You can see which are the type of services we'll be providing, which are the size of the patients uh, you'll be seeing, uh, the how you are going to assess it, how you're going to uh, kind of find the funds for it, all those things are there. Uh, coming to the next education section, we have completed demonstration. So whatever we are demonstrating here uh, in uh, Trivandrum at our headquarters through uh, Trivandrum Institute of Palliative Science, all those uh, services we are trying to uh, put it in the education format. So TIPS, Trivandrum Institute of Palliative Science, have collaborated with Project ECHO. ECHO is an application form for extension for community health outcomes. These are the project for building uh, capacity building programs in healthcare and educational sectors. We have collaborated with uh, the program which you are attending now, the CPM is uh, hosted by the TIPS ECHO uh, facility. They are providing uh, training programs in three different formats, residential, online ECHO, and on-site. Online ECHO, this is the program, uh, once the forward uh, uh, due to COVID, most of our programs are going online. 
So basically, we train doctors, nurses, uh, allied healthcare professionals, volunteers, student volunteers. That's a, a pilot in Shapeel, ongoing in Shapeel, very successful in Shapeel, uh, uh, giving ownership to the students, uh, college students, for taking the uh, ownership or, and supporting the community uh, near their neighborhood. Palliative beneficiaries, uh, this is an Arohan uh, program named uh, is Arohan. This is for palliative beneficiaries and sharing uh, the uh, stories with the uh, lived experiences. These are the basic picture. So we have a variety of programs just for your uh, reference. Uh, these are the residential programs, uh, which you can see the star on hold due to COVID. Uh, actually, personally, I believe training should be taken uh, here at uh, TIPS in on-site format. We have a beautiful uh, training center here at our Pallium India headquarters. These are the uh, courses available there. And on-site programs, outside TIPS, once you uh, uh, once your training is completed, uh, you go you go to back go back to your institutions. You start your own uh, palliative care facilities there. Who you are supporting you? We'll conduct these training programs there. We'll send our faculties to your uh, locations uh, to your institutions, and we'll conduct training program, awareness session, orientation program. You can see the days and duration. All these uh, facilities are provided on site program. So I'll stop here. Uh, this is the basic demonstration and education format of Palin India uh, model. Whatever I have shared here till now are the basic facilities, the how Palin India is organizing and implementing uh, here in Trivandrum through our tips and other uh, facilities. Uh, from here on, uh, I'll uh, hand over to Sunanda for mentioning about the, how we are facilitating these services through other states especially the challenges uh, we are facing in other states or the ground realities we are facing there, that will be uh, more useful for you as potential palliative care physicians. So over to you, Sunanda. Uh, thank you very much, Vishnu. And once again, good evening to everybody. And it's uh, really a privilege to be a part of this uh, learned audience, I'll say, because I have a huge regard for doctors. So once again, good evening and namaste. So as uh, uh, Vishnu was explaining about the uh, demonstration and education, so and the last part uh, of this uh, presentation will be the facilitation. So what exactly we as a team, uh, as state facilitation, uh, what we exactly do. So I'll just start sharing my screen. Is it visible? Shripriya? Yes, yes, it is visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. okay. So uh, to start with, as already uh, Vishnu has shared, that it's a team of five people headed by Shalini. And we have uh, four different regional coordinators uh, across the country uh, looking after uh, different uh, states. So uh, the basic objective of this division is uh, as you can see in the slide, it's, uh, we try to facilitate new palliative care centers because I think uh, we really need it because there aren't sufficient number of PCCs. And we also try to integrate the health, uh, I mean, uh, palliative care in the uh, mainstream of health in three levels of healthcare. We try to uh, organize more and more workshops um, uh, for information and knowledge enhancement. Uh, through collaboration with public and partner stakeholders so that you can we can reach more and more people and one of the uh, you know very important uh, objective is also that we try to uh, conduct workshops for opioid availability which is a really big challenge uh, many places as per our experience we have seen and uh, we tried to uh, you know organize a legal framework workshops and uh, these these workshops are, are basically for the straight drug controller officers and the government officials uh, as and when required and uh, we also try to uh, mobilize the volunteers and uh, we uh, always insist on the community engagement am i audible yes Sananda, yes yeah 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 okay Fine. Uh, and um, uh, we also were trying to uh, facilitate in uh, learning in the medical institute, like, you know, to develop curriculum uh, for the medical students. That's one of our objective. Uh, the work is still going on. So moving on.
Okay, so uh, this is a detail of what we all do in our, the, in our team. So as I said, we organize awareness programs for government officials, NGOs, and general public. So uh, by general public, I mean it can be like uh, any Rotary Club or any kind of club, those who are interested or those who show interest that uh, we want to know more about it. And we also uh, have specialized trainings for nurse, doctors, LR professionals and volunteers. Uh, by volunteers, I mean we have our uh, customized training, uh, which is called the VTP Volunteers Training Program. And we connect with the state drug controller for implementation of NDPS. Uh, so uh, for doing this, we have meetings first. We uh, you know take appointments, meet them, explain them, and try to find out what is actually happening in that state. And if they're still uh, following the old rules, we try to show them with the uh, latest, uh, you know, documents. What are the form forms? How they can, you know, update it. So this is how we move. And uh, obviously, we connect with NHMs uh, and the director of health service official wherever it's required uh, for promoting the palliative care in government institutes. We educate pharmacists of the medical institutes, especially on the RMIs, like recognized medical institute, how to apply for that, and uh, you know, get the certificate. We also help in creating proposals for developing new PCC uh, with, uh, you know, uh, outpatient, inpatient and home care services. And as you all know, the documentation and record maintenance is also important. We also do the handholding for that. We also help in budget estimation, recruitment support, infrastructure guidance and process of procuring and dispensing opioids as uh, Vishnu was also explaining. A patient referral by creating awareness in the region and hospital. Um, as and when required, as per the request. Now coming to the IEC material, many of the hospitals, like I can uh, immediately tell you right now, with my experience in Orissa, the, uh, I met one of the uh, doctors. So they had everything except they were saying that we really need help for developing IEC materials because they also feel that is not their forte. So we also get this kind of uh, request from different uh, organizations and hospitals. Now coming to, we also help in facilitation of funds uh, within the region. Also, uh, you know, facilitation of government health infrastructure, community engagement, as I said. Yeah, monitoring and evaluation of new palliative care. As a, when we start a particular new PCC, we don't leave it as it is. We were, we'll always be there till it is, you know, a standalone uh, center. So we uh, do that and we help uh, the particular team. We also facilitate volunteer network uh, through participants from our training, uh, which means that when we have our trainings, after the trainings, if anybody is interested to volunteer for some of our work, we note that, we connect with them uh, and so on. And uh, uh, the last but not the least, we do the website support in which we have HR recruitment website directory of all palliative care centers in India. So in this uh, slide, as you can see, there's a map which shows the national presence of Palam India. We have uh, footprints in 27 states and three union territories, uh, mostly divided into five categories. We have PCCs, which we have catalyzed and collaborated. We have pain-free hospital project sites. We have PCC training centers. We have worked with certain uh, state governments, NHMs and drug controllers, and we have on-site foundation training centers. Okay, now here, uh, the left hand side, you can see we have collaborated with 19 NHMs, national health missions uh, across the country uh, for education, uh, training, uh, developing of PC centers through NPPC. And here are the list of few, uh, you know, states, uh, which all trainings they have taken. Now coming to the right hand side, we have done uh, we are focused on policy and its implementation, like developing uh, PIP for the state, uh, implementation of NPC, NPPC, development of PCC through health and wellness centers, development of state policy. Then uh, regarding drug av availability and access to medicines, we have NDPS amendment implemented, which we are still struggling with. We are still focusing on that. Uh, worked with the state uh, drug controller, create awareness um, among the medical institute for new RMI inclusion of opiates in the uh, state essential drug list. Coming on to education and capacity, we have workshop orientations, uh, FCPM, FCPN, like we are, this is one of the session going on. We have pali COVID training. We have specialized training for CHOs, ASHA and ANMs of the health department. 
Uh, we have training for uh, faculty of CBME and EDCOM. We have training and engagement of volunteers. I'm audible? Yes, Sananda. Yeah, yeah. So now, as uh, we were discussing that we have four regional coordinators, I'll focus on the north first. So for the uh, north region, we have Mr. Rajendra Dad Bijilwan. This is his number. So he's looking after, he's assigned with 12 states, Ladakh, JNK, Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, Haryana, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Chharkhand, Rajasthan, Delhi, and Chandigarh. So here I would request that any of you are from this part of the country, you can contact him for anything that you need from us. I move ahead. So uh, we have just put down very uh, important highlights for the North region. Like the highlights, recent highlights are, we have partnership with NHMs and private stakeholders to facilitate palliative care training and program implementation. Uh, our regional coordinator has also catalyzed new palliative care centers and training institute, naming a few sub-district hospital Ambala, Haryana, Gurbachan Memorial Hospital, which is a CMC unit of Ludhiana, Laltan Kalan Ludhiana, Yamuna Karuna Sanstha, and Janseva Hospital, Sri Ganganagar, Rajasthan, and so on. So he's also organized uh, workshops and meetings, especially on opiate availability with NHM gov government of Jammu and Kashmir and NHM Haryana. A uh, workshop was also done on implementation of NPPC Uttarakhand uh, and Haryana. Uh, he's also facilitated with engagement of implementation of NPPC. And we have also received a government order from the NHM Uttarakhand recently. And uh, we have also uh, got the terms of engagement signed with Yamuna Karan Sanstha, uh, Pansaib, Himachal Pradesh. So these are a few highlights, recent highlights in the North region. Uh, now coming to the uh, region specific challenges. Uh, so uh, here are a few, as you all know, North is extreme climate. So uh, the geographical locations are also very uh, difficult. So this is definitely one of the challenges that we face <clears throat> when we travel and when we you know, uh, try to implement something. So the second one is, uh, there are a lot of transfers happening in the government doctors and nurses. So for example, if a particular group is trained in a particular state and then move away, so like the follow-up uh, is uh, you know, disrupted. And uh, the third point here is that uh, we have to maintain a particular protocol to contact the officials. So we like, especially with the government sector, like you have to go through a particular way and meet um, to reach to reach them is a big challenge uh, because you have to maintain a certain protocol, and that takes a, a hell lot of time. Uh, so that's we put it as a challenge. And uh, the last point here is that uh, in some places we have been questioned like. Uh, like, do you have office out here in the state? So as you all know, we are, dif we are differently placed, but we don't have a, you know, office as such in every state. So this is sometimes this question comes up. So we have put it as a challenge. So let's have a few glimpses of the north. So this one to the left is uh, uh, Rajendraji, our RC, uh, with the team, uh, with the palliative care team of Guru Ramdas Hospice, Amritsa. And to the right, you can see the PGI Chandigarh meeting is going on with Dr. Mini Arora. So this is all the facilitation outcome of our digital coordinator. So this is to my left is the uh, Can Fight Cancer Society's Ludhiana building is under construction. And this one to the right is a Chandigarh hospice. As you can see, it's so beautiful. So now we're moving on to the Northeast. Uh, so Northeast is uh, uh, taken care of by Rontu Sangma, who is based in Guwahati. And uh, he's assigned these nine uh, states, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Meghalaya, Tripura, Sikkim, and West Bengal. So again, highlighting the uh, achievements, uh, the you know few of the achievements, uh, recently. So now the RMI laws are being practiced in Nagaland, Assam, Mizoram and few institutes in West Bengal. So this is a very good uh, achievement actually because most of the uh, cases RMIs are still they're running with the uh, old ones. Uh, so this is a good uh, achievement. So second one is participants uh, from NHM 
uh, for our we had on site trainings also so on site and online trainings we had participants from mizoram manipur nagaland meghalaya and tripura so uh, nhsrc with the support of palem india has provided training to eight northeastern states and again uh, for the opioid availability workshop even run to uh, our regional coordinator has uh, facilitated for these uh, three states mizoram sikkim and himachal pradesh sorry arunachal pradesh i'm so sorry so uh, coming on to the challenges for the northeast um, shortage of palliative care specialist uh, this is i think it will go for many of the regions also and also lim this limits to only cancer patients and as we all know uh, we uh, agree that there's an inadequate knowledge about palliative care among many of the service providers which is a big challenge and there are times when we find that uh, you know it is there's a reluctance to discuss about palliative care with a concerned patient just assuming or thinking that they lose hope so which is not the case so uh, this is also we are feeling that it's a challenge and uh, apart from that we have a lack of state policy uh, to upscale the services uh, because this is a uh, growing need so and lack of adequate infrastructure in some places and we don't have appropriate referral services also which is a big challenge fund crisis obviously to ensure the uninterrupted supply of morphine and other essential drugs so in north is uh, to put together these are the challenges which uh, uh, we feel needs to be discussed yeah so again we have some glimpses from the north is so this to the left is uh, the saint joseph palliative care center in nagaland which is under construction and here is uh, shalini she's she had visited i think in the month of november and to the right is uh, as you can see the uh, the back is the rumtek monastery so this is um, the chief of the monastery and with uh, around to our original coordinator and uh, this is uh, shalini and they have also initiated some uh, palliative care through community mobilization and now here to the left this is a palliative care team uh, in namchi district hospital sikkim where our team had visited Uh, shalini and ron to and here there's a meeting um, with the state drug controller and secretary palliative care society of manipur so okay now coming to the central uh, region which uh, i'm looking after so i have been assigned seven state gujarat daman diu madhya pradesh maharashtra chatisgarh odisha and goa so uh, regarding if i talk about the highlights um in orissa after um i met uh, quite a few uh, organizations i feel that there's a uh, you know a low level of knowledge about exactly what is palliative care so uh, i think after a lot of interaction meetings and workshops there uh, has been a raise in the awareness level uh, and a lot of good collaborations is going on in orissa there's an increased demand of attending palliative Uh, palam india trainings uh, which was not seen earlier in these uh, states so like in gujarat also people have approached in chatisgarh also so that's a good thing and uh, i have been mentoring many um, organizations in mp in chatisgarh for the rmi license uh, there are two things one is the procurement and second is the like renewal uh, so these things are going on and uh, um, in orissa uh, we got a good support from the state drugs controller which is very unusual but uh, it happened like they were very very uh, you know happy to and they assured us that you name it like any organization if they uh, submit today within a one week we're going to uh, you know disperse the certificate and all that so that kind of promise uh, they had um, given to us in our meetings now coming to the challenges um as for my experience i was like meeting uh, quite few people i found that uh, palliative care mostly is there but not obviously in the top priority list uh, that's uh, i think i feel as a challenge and in many cases endless follow ups are required you have to really go on and on and uh, to get things done and uh, another challenge that i feel is that uh, whenever it's a ngo led initiative so uh, 
I think it's not very appealing for uh, many of the officials. So uh, not in all cases, but mostly. So that's one of the challenge. And coming to the trainings, um, money matters, I, I feel so, because when uh, there's a money involved, so that's a you know back foot. And if it's free, then I mean, maybe it's underrated. So that's how uh, I feel. And uh, the challenge, I think the biggest challenge is to convince people for trainings because uh, I think training is a first step because knowledge, I mean, having the knowledge myself is more important um, if I have to speak uh, in front of others. So uh, that's what the challenges we have noted down for the central region. So glimpses, uh, this is one of the newly upcoming rehabilitation and palliative care centers in Bhubaneswar, Orissa. Uh, so they have uh, indoor facilities and home care currently. This is Sipla Foundation, which I visited recently, uh, which is in Pune. Uh, beautiful setup. Uh, they're focusing only on cancer patients. So very, very good uh, center and very, very dedicated workers. Uh, really, very good. So uh, now we are left with South India. So Vishnu uh, is heading that. Uh, he's been assigned with eight states, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Telangana. Uh, Andhra Pradesh, Lakshadweep, Puducherry, Andaman, and Nicoba Islands. Uh, coming to the highlights, uh, I think uh, we all know that South India is taking a lead actually. So if you compare palliative care situation with other parts of the country, South is leading, uh, but still we have some regional challenges and Kerala with highest community-based palliative care services, so that's a plus point and uh, niche-based palliative care services like Disabled for Profit Initiative, Pediatric Services. Uh, Vishnu, I think uh, if you think that you want to also contribute, you can. Um, so, uh, and strong primary level institution and private players. Vishnu, do you want to add? Yeah, regarding, uh, thank you, Sanita, for saying that. Regarding the niche-based palliative care services, we have a couple of requests, a couple of uh, interest coming from Telangana. Uh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, but basically from most of the states, uh, new ideas, new innovations are coming for palliative care services, for exclusive uh, starting palliative care services exclusively for differently abled or disabled patients. Uh, palliative care services are coming uh, uh, with new ideas like for-profit initiatives for geriatric patients, uh, exclusive palliative care, pediatric patients. So uh, they, they are going to the next level of palliative care. Uh, so, dish based palliative care services is really a, a, a USB for South Indian states. Mm -hmm. there are, yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Vishnu. So, um, for South, also, we have some challenges. Like uh, the other day, in some of the workshop, we found, we realized that in Lakshadweep, uh, this is actually uh, one of the doctors shared so that they don't have a dedicated drug controller office for that union territory. So, they are dependent on the Kerala state. Uh, drug controller office. That's one of the challenge. And uh, I think he was also uh, saying that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lack in, uh, you know, there's a delay in uh, getting the, procuring the drugs and all. So they don't get it in time. And coming to the challenges in South, we need more palliative care awareness in rural areas. Yeah. So this is one of the challenges. Uh, it's required because most of the people in the rural areas are not still aware, uh, far away from that. So, and uh, there's a reluctance to change with new NDPS amendment. Yeah, this I think will go for uh, most of the other regions also that uh, people are quite comfortable with that. And uh, I think there's also a fear, like they don't want to get into. So that's uh, reluctance is there. And yeah, the slow transition in the policy level intervention. So that will take some time. So I think this is what we have uh, jotted down. Now coming to, we've just uh, collated the challenges totally in Indian context. Uh, we are divided into three parts, like uh, uh, one is the lack of awareness of concept of palliative care uh, within three different uh, you know, categories, medical fraternity, government, and general public. Uh, lack of knowledge about government programs on palliative care, that's MPPC, uh, health uh, and wellness centers, state policy programs. Lack of information on opioid accessibility and process. So this is with the drug control controllers and medical institutes. Uh, coming to the barriers. 
So again, I think uh, it's almost a repetition of many of the points. Uh, so reluctance to change, as we said, and government officials about implementation and uh, asking for budget because palliative care budget is uh, I mean, usually uh, not seen in the PIP. So maybe they have to struggle for that. So asking for budget in the PIPs. Uh, coming to medical fraternity to accept palliative care beyond cancer and AIDS. So it should not be limited to that. To accept it that, uh, as Vishnu, I think he was insisting that it should be starting from the time of diagnosis, not just the end of life care. Uh, to prescribe opioids, that's also a big barrier, like, you know, uh, that's, uh, and then referring patients to palliative care. As I said, fear of procuring uh, uh, opioids uh, because of the misuse, they, they're uh, anticipating that it might be misused somewhere. So that is one of the reasons. For general public patients and caregivers uh, to understand what is palliative care, what is the use of opioids like morphine. Uh, coming to hospital administration, it's not an uh, it's not a profit earning business like you know most of them. So maybe they're not focusing more into palliative care, and it's not only for the dying, and reallocation of resources to a lost cause. So uh, these are certain barriers. If actually these things will be taken care of, palliative care will be at the next level for sure. So I think uh, we have finished with the presentation. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. So Vishnu. Uh, so Thank you, Sunita, uh, for the detail uh, sharing, uh, detail sharing about our Can experience. Can I stop sharing now? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So I see uh, Shalini is here in this meeting. Uh, so as I informed earlier, she is the uh, head of the state facilitation division. She is our reporting officer. So Shalini, would you like to uh, share some words with the participants here? Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. My apologies, I won't be able to switch on the video. Otherwise, you'll not be able to hear me also. This is a major uh, bandwidth challenge. So. Uh, Sorry, I joined late. There is a conference on palliative care, uh, which is going on. Uh, I would really suggest all of you also to be part of uh, that conference. It is a two days conference, which is uh, started today. It is available today, tomorrow, uh, and on Sunday. Uh, sorry, we are giving an information now, but I think better late than never. Uh, but this conference happens every year. Um, I'll, I'll take a minute to talk about it. I Actually, uh, because this is a very, very knowledgeable uh, piece of information. Uh, every year, this conference happens and you actually get to hear a lot of palliative care initiatives and how palliative care is coming up in India. So whatever we presented, Sunanda and uh, uh, Vishnu presented today, you will hear it from the star worlds of palliative care uh, in, in this conference. And that was one of the reasons that I couldn't join earlier. Uh, I was attending that session and I bring you the learning from that session. Uh, it was, uh, it's such a coincidence that uh, the session I was attending was talking about funding for uh, opening up a new palliative care center. And uh, I just wanted to share quick uh, excerpts from there. Uh, I'm sure this group has uh, doctors from uh, all sectors. It must be from government, from uh, private, charitable, or uh, medical universities. Uh, so um, I would just want to highlight that anywhere you are planning to open up a palliative care center, if you are inclined to open up a palliative care center, I think the very first thing you would need is, of course, the will to do. And as you are already here taking this course, that clearly shows that you are really inclined to work for palliative care. If you second is if you really wanted to do it yourself or you want to do it with your institute, we Palium India is there to support you in, in any way. Now, the very uh, post that you first need to think where the money is going to come from, where the funding is going to come from. And uh, we had in this, in this discussion on the conference four people, uh, four very senior faculty and doctors from uh, different uh, institutes in India where palliative care is running. One is uh, from, uh, one was Dr. Gayatri Palat from Hyderabad. Uh, if any of you are from Hyderabad, MNJ Cancer Institute has a beautiful department of uh, palliative care medicine, and they also have a wonderful pediatric palliative care offering. 
So she was sharing how in a government sector, you are able to get funding uh, for, for building a palliative care. So any of you doctors who are working in either in medical colleges or district hospitals or primary health care centers, uh, there is a huge funding available in the government sector that you can uh, apply for, you can work to get it. Uh, that was a session. And of course, uh, Pallium India can help you with uh, with how to get it. We have been, as Sunanda and Vishnu have shared, we have been working with a lot of national health missions, which is a primary body in every state to get uh, palliative care implemented. So we, we would always be there to support if you are uh, the doctors in the government sector. The other... Uh, section of uh, people who would want to start is if you are belonging to a charitable or a trust hospital, or you plan to open up a trust or a charitable uh, source of income. So majority or source of income would be donors or the CSRs, uh, that corporate uh, social responsibilities of the corporates, uh, the funding from that. So in, in that case, I, your primary focus uh, would be uh, building donor relationships so that individuals as well as uh, institutional. So you will have to see that the funds come from regular individuals. They first see your work, they believe in your work, and then they become regular donors. Uh, Pallium India is working on donation only, and uh, they they are the ones, uh, there are people in within Pallium India who are keeping regular connects with our donor for ensuring that they uh, stay connected, updated, and uh, they get to hear about Pallium India initiatives and uh, they, they continue to be part of this beautiful work. At the same time, if uh, you're looking for funding from corporates, uh, you can apply for corporate social responsibility funding, which is generally, I think, two to three percent as per government laws. They are very strict about using their funds. Uh, there are ways to apply for uh, that uh, funding. There are proposals that you have to submit. Again, Pallium India can help you. Our regional coordinators can help you to create those proposals. Uh, so that is where you can get funding if you're planning to start a charitable unit or work through uh, funds, uh, donor funds. The third sector where, uh, and of, of course, uh, to share, uh, to connect it with the session I attended, this was, uh, this charitable sector was represented by uh, Can Support, which is a home base, uh, which is a organization in Delhi and provides home-based palliative care around uh, and a very famous established, it's been already 25 years that they're working in this field. The third sector uh, that was uh, an university uh, where uh, this was Manipal University uh, in Manipal, where Dr. Naveen Salins had joined and he was sharing how palliative care can be started in an uh, education sector where you are, where you have medical students. So some of you doctors might be belonging to medical colleges or uh, universities here. So how you can actually begin a palliative care unit in, in that uh, sector. Uh, generally, universities are autonomous bodies. They have a, a governing body who decides where the funds would be allocated. So you would have to share, you'll have to connect the palliative care delivery with the vision that university has. And of course, the whole concept of palliative care needs to be taught to the students, whether they are nurses or doctors so that they stay connected from the point of their education. Uh, so th there also, we will work with you. Currently, Palam India is running a program where we are training doctor faculties and nurses faculty uh, in universities so that they can uh, educate the students on palliative care. And all through their MBBS curriculum, they are able to uh, learn about palliative care, which was not there before 2019. So it, it, uh, the MBBS curriculum had ETCOM model starting 2019 only. So th th this was the third sector. The fourth sector was is the corporate sector. And in India, 80% of healthcare is delivered through corporate. So we really, really want this corporate sector to come up. I'm not too sure how many doctors here are from corporate. Uh, but uh, this is this is a huge uh, this is a huge opportunity in this field to develop palliative care. On the onset, we were thinking this is not a resource generating model, so uh, corporates might not be interested to take a palliative care. But slowly, we are realizing that 
this is uh, not all corporates are always focused on uh, profit building they also focus their services on value addition how what different are you offering to patients their families so corporates would definitely go in for this palliative care if you are able to uh, really share with them how palliative care can actually enhance their services and uh, most importantly if you will bring home care based in corporate services you have seen covid during covid it, there were so many home care facilities that got initiated and that's how palliative care can earn profits for corporate so that's a sustainability model where you are uh, a profit building model where you can earn profits and still give palliative care so there are the four ways to have funding uh, uh, whichever a sector you belong to you can have more detailed discussions with our e coordinators and we can support you to open up a, a palliative care center or help you develop a palliative care center so i just wanted to add that because i just finished uh, <laughs> taking this uh, this beautiful knowledge from those session from the conference i thought what best way i, I would just share it with you all uh, but we are there for the support uh, there are any questions there are uh, two uh, charts already uh, one from dr deepak uh, dr deepak is working in an asi hospital in kolkata so he is telling that he is interested to start uh, his own palliative care services uh, and one from dr banerji uh, uh, dr banerji you are in assam right and uh, she doesn't have much support from the organization and how can i get connected uh, uh, to be part of this so one is uh, alini the... are you there uh, sorry i was talking and i was on mute i'm sorry Uh, we had recently made a visit to ASI Saldia when we were in West Bengal. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the person whom we met. Uh, there is actually palliative care uh, services available in ASI Hospital, and I think his name is uh, he's he's a very active advocate. Uh, Doctor, uh, is Ron there on call? Uh, For any chance? No, so uh, no, Stalin. Stalin is not there. No, no. Okay, okay. Uh, we have yes, uh, Doctor Shubroto Goswami. Uh, do you know? Uh, yeah, Doctor Shubroto Goswami. Uh, he is our course coordinator. I am a fellow in pain management. I am doing fellowship okay. in pain management under him only. And okay. we have okay. a palliative care department, but actually palliative care is has not yet been applied or started there. We are basically practicing pain management, and Sir is right. also very much interested in setting up a full fledged palliative care setup. Uh, right. Uh, we had a meeting with him, and uh, we were sharing about what are the different ways. Uh, uh so that's the reason i think one of the ways we uh, you can do is to approach the national health missions uh because you are this is a government sector uh, so we would really encourage you to pursue through government uh, sources they have a budget i am not too sure how much esi because esi is a central body uh, so the i think the funding and all comes from the center and not from the state but i'm sure uh, i think we can take uh, Ron, uh, ask Ron to connect with you, and he will coordinate with the NHM uh, nodal officer, and we can figure out how uh, resources can be uh, allocated or can be helped for ESI. That is one way. The other way would be, uh, you know, look for some uh, funding from some uh, charitable organizations. or uh, csr or for that matter um, there are a lot of foreign funds also for foreign uh, bodies who are interested in investing uh, but first have a proposal and plan like how you want to start a, a, a unit like who all what you want to uh, deploy is there a doctor nurse and uh, um a social worker do you want to start with that do you want to have a vehicle for home care so i, I would suggest just think through it and have a proposal ready 
and share with us also uh, so then when we get a chance to uh, support our funding um, get a chance from a funder to support an institute we can offer that however uh, one big suggestions to everyone uh, you know with every time you will have to begin something at your end first you will have to start doing something at your end first and for expansion you can ask uh, um, you know ask for funds outside whether it is government whether it's foreign uh, donations whether it's uh, funding india funding agency they would always want to see the work that is happening right now then they get impressed and then they want to invest in you to expand it so even if you are able to start at a very small level just try starting there uh one of the suggestions for esi kolkata i can have is there is a there is an organization called eipc uh working eastern india palliative care we can connect uh, them with you and probably in a partnership uh government public private partnership we can build on something because uh, in cnci hospital that's how uh palliative care got built because uh, there was one rumor of vedna hospice uh, there is they are still working there they partnered with cnci cnci hospital and the palliative care services uh, department got built there so few examples i'm sharing with you uh, but i think we can discuss more in detail when ron is around yeah i'm so yeah uh we'll be putting <laughs> excuse me the um the, the the team so dr deepak will be uh will be uh, connecting you both so that uh, you can okay thanks thanks and again uh, dr banerjee is also um in uh, asking about assam taste group uh, yes uh, uh yeah so uh, mr ba uh, dr banerjee i think you're uh, planning to start a home care if it is uh, but your organization won't help uh, which kind of organization do you belong to like may i know uh dr banerji can you hear me yeah she is typing in the chat ecs is is it is it a government body or is it i'm sorry i i'm not too sure about ecs Can you hear me, ma'am? You are muted. I think while Dr. Banerjee is typing, uh, there is a question. Yeah, I'll take the other question. Yeah, I'll take the other question for the corporate. I'm in a corporate hospital, but want to start my own center. Uh, you work in Gurgaon, um, Dr. Shweta. Uh, we would be happy to write now. Actually, I'm in Delhi. I wish we could have met and we can discuss in person. But we can always have a virtual meeting in a corporate hospital. I think the very first thing uh, will be to have an awareness session. I think this kind of thing is with every hospital. If you want to bring your colleagues uh, uh, into it, in the sense that uh, you want to convince them. But oh, sorry, you said that you want to start your own center. so first of all i think you will have to think on the funding part how are you going to fund your own center if it is your personal funds that you are investing then we would suggest to start very uh, very small probably you hiring a nurse and a and a and a social worker and if you can use your own vehicle and just start off a home care or probably uh, start off an opd in your uh, in your house or a small clinic if you already have but and you're already getting trained so um, you would have the training of palliative care with you you can have a small team get them trained as well and uh, as you move on uh, if you establish a proper clinic then you would need uh, the rmi uh, certificate to procure opioids also that is full fledgedly on your own however if you want to uh, collaborate with some government center government center or with a corporate one that is also an op option so you will have to explore what opportunities you have have around okay i see i see okay it is for ex army people okay uh yeah so we do have request like there is one doctor in bangalore who works in a command hospital and she shares the challenges that 
she has been wanting to do palliative care. She's a gynec and she's been wanting to do palliative care. And she has to convince her commander and then ask them to, uh, you know, allow a little bit of palliative care or include palliative care in their government sector. So I think we'll have to sit and understand uh, what challenges your organization uh, would offer. And we can discuss it further, Dr. Banerjee. Yeah, I think uh, I've heard about recently, they, not very recently, but uh, they had a program, Dr. Savita and Stylus, uh, you were also Delhi, in the Army Hospital in Delhi. Yes, yes. Even I heard somewhere that they have recently started uh, something. So we can uh, bring in Dr. Savita Butola and take a, take a understanding from her also. Sister so, uh, Stella was a part of this program also. So I think there must be something. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, we will be able to connect. So I think, uh, uh, Dr. Shredevi, I think uh, we need to have the telephone numbers of all these doctors so that our regional coordinators can connect with them in person. And then as a separate discussion, we can take these individual cases and then build on. And those who have not interacted in the chat, you can just uh, send your in region in the WhatsApp group that we have so that we can uh, share the contacts uh, with the state facilitation team. For those who want to uh, get a connect but not able to speak up now or not able to type it in the chat. And Dr. Shweta, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Shri, the right direct would be if they are okay, they can simply call the regional coordinators uh, or they can simply send the email to uh, any of us and we'll pick it up from there uh, yeah. if they are not able to because communication through uh, you know it'll be a direct communication and we'll just start get on so they're most welcome yeah i was telling dr shweta that uh, in every conference there is now a session on the palliative care in the corporate sector and today they had a session called let's talk about money they right. from the corporate sector they have actually uh, talked about uh, how they could convince uh, in terms of uh, I mean, the, 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 the biggest rejection most of them faced in the beginning was about uh, it's not a money making department and that's like utilizing all of the resources than bringing in a lot of income but there are uh, I mean, a lot of uh, places where people have able to convince that how it can be uh, an income generating department also uh, so I think um, I think now it's not a difficult task because many many uh, private sector hospitals, corporate hospitals have palliative care unit on there. Even even in Delhi, there are a lot. Yeah, I was uh, sharing my learning from the same session. Uh, she, I don't know, uh, like in the beginning, I I just come out of that session and wanted to. So I think we we were both were there. So. Now I attended that session. Great, great. <laughs> I think that's a very, very useful session. And maybe we can put you in touch with uh, people like, uh, like we have friends uh, who have developed palliative care in the Max Hospital or in the Aster, Dr. Agarindra was working there. <coughs> the corporate sector. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so if you want to share or ask specific questions, we might be able to put you in touch with them. Uh, yeah, sorry, Dr. Sridevi, I didn't see you in the meeting. Sorry to uh, forgot to introduce you for the participants. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Sridevi is the head uh, of our uh, education. Team. <laughs> so yeah, I forgot to introduce. She is the head of our academic division. So actually, due to time constraint, I couldn't comment on the role of education in delivering all our services. So just if you could comment on that part, it would be great, uh, Dr. Sridevi. Uh, no, I think uh, we have been hearing from you since 16, 17 sessions. <laughs> okay. So he's actually the facilitator of this. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, are there any other questions uh, to the team uh, before winding up today's session? Ma'am, I wanted to. I wanted to know regarding the uh, employment opportunities or the teaching opportunities in palliative care. 
like i am presently an anesthetist working in corporate hospital where uh, not much of palliative care is actually there and they are not very encouraging also in this aspect but if i think of switching over to palliative care centers employment opportunities or if i am interested in learning and then teaching palliative care then what can be the avenues i hope you know that uh, there are many institutes in the in india coming up with md palliative md and pnb program and uh, in the last neat pg entrance i think uh, all of the seats were taken like less than 10000 branches it, it initially it was there only in tmh and aims delhi where people take it up as a last option where they don't know what palliative care is but this year onwards the scenario completely changed and they are looking for teaching faculty in most of these medical colleges uh, they are looking for clinical um, md in clinical um, uh, side with some experience in palliative care so yeah uh, it's it's a growing uh, area where um, in, where there are a lot of md and dnb courses coming up in the whole country and there are many more colleges in the line who is applying for that um, and to start md program but there are uh, so many institutes which start which are starting the program this year so i think uh, there are a lot of options ma'am but i can't do a second md now <laughs> no, you don't need it they are asking for md in any clinical clinical uh, sector with some experience in palliative care because and there are not much md people to be faculty uh, in palliative medicine right md palliative medicine started a few years back so there are only a few uh, specialists uh, in the, in the country so now as faculty we are asking for md in, in general medicine anesthesia all comes under that uh, even radiotherapy a bit some experience in in palliative care okay. thank you ma'am so this is a right time if you are looking for a teaching opportunity because many many colleges are looking for starting uh, mp programs uh, yes dr deepak you had a question i am regarding how we can join it now i am really interested in joining the ongoing palliative care conference Oh, that's all mentioned yeah uh, so you can just uh, sorry yeah you can uh, just uh, type iapcon international association of palliative care conference 2022 uh, so then you will get into a web page of iapcon 2022 which is happening in jaipur so there you have a um, in a click button where you can click to register so if you just uh, click on to that yeah, so vishnu has sent the link in the chat uh uh dr shirley but still they are taking up registrations so you can register i mean even today there are people who have registered today in the afternoon so yeah so that is possible the link is there so just click on that and then the whole program schedule everything will come up there were a good a, a lot of uh, good pre conference workshop also but unfortunately that is over like on 10 11 the 10th of feb uh but yeah at least uh, tomorrow and day after tomorrow there are many interesting sessions happening and next year just uh, i mean it is to be held at bangalore so this year itself they start accepting the registrations for this year is there any other courses through palliam india uh so, so ma'am we do have a refresher course so those who have completed this course will have an opportunity to update like something like an advanced course okay. where uh, where you will be learning in detail about many of the medications many of the symptoms uh this is a collaborative course with palim india and university of iowa where we get faculty from usa and from palim uh so that is one refresher course and we have a specific specialty based course the first thing that we are planning to uh do is in pulmonology so any pulmonologist in the group uh who are interested to learn more about palliative care and pulmonology in integration uh so like that we are, will be introducing courses which will be circulated in all the groups all these whatsapp group will be keep keeping on updating uh, all the all the new courses and as as i mentioned uh, we'll be uh, very quickly starting with the individual virtual mentoring program where you will be assigned to one specific mentor where you can bring up real patient or scenarios and have one to one discussion with the mentor thank you
So if there are no other questions, maybe we can wind up today's sessions and we are, we, uh, we, we can, all, I mean, I like always, you can always uh, type it in the chat, I mean, WhatsApp, uh, whether you have some more questions regarding today's session. Uh, we'll put you in connect with the right people. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, State Facilitation Team, for taking them through the work of Tali Media and Agent Wise and to give an idea about how you do things and what all support can be provided uh, uh, for people who are really interested to start this area. Uh, thank you so much, all the members from the State Facilitation Team. Uh, there are people who have not talked, like Rajan Prasi, I think, in the session, but to, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being with us. And thank you, all the participants, for the interaction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiddhi. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you. A special thanks to the state facilitation team who could bring out a beautiful picture about what Palim India has been doing and what we are trying to achieve. And it does motivate us. As a team, it does motivate us a lot when we are seeing that participants are willing to start up their own centers. Participants are willing to come up and serve the community with palliative care in what all ways they could. So it is definitely a piece of motivation for us as well. So with that note, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Sri Dev Varyar and the state facilitation team signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. See you in the next session with another topic and another faculty. Till then, everyone take care. Bye-bye.